from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I want to apologize a little bit because of the little chaotic nature. Sometimes we have technical issues and it's out of our control. Usually we have two screens, but for some reason today we were not able to get two screens hooked up. So feel cozy, get closer, move closer if you like to. There's only one screen. Uh, this is a high-tech presentation, which means uh, there's a lot of audio video involved. And so you probably don't want to miss any of the video clips. So um, um, I want to extend... Um, Welcome to everyone who bothered to make time on during a week, uh, during lunch hour. I know that it's difficult to get to the library and it's not the easiest thing to get here. And what a turnout, fantastic. And um, on behalf of Mary Jane D. Bauer Chief and uh, Joan Weeks, the head of the Near East, I want to welcome you. Unfortunately, both of them are away, not here. Uh, this is the African and Middle Eastern Division. We have three sections here. Uh, the Hebraic section, which focuses on Judaica and Hebrew and all materials that have to do with Semitic languages. The Near East section, which focuses on all the Arab uh, world uh, countries, Arabic language around the world, and uh, Iranic languages uh, from, uh, of course, Persian, um, Pashto, Kurdish, and other Iranian languages, as well as Turkic languages, all the way from Central Asia and Western China to the Caucasus, as well as the Caucasian uh, peoples, the Armenians, the Georgians, and other Caucasus peoples. It's a big division. We, have, we represent over 80-something uh, countries. And of course, we have the African section here also as well, which deals with sub-Saharan Africa. It's a huge division. I'm hoping that this will inspire you to come and visit us and uh, take in uh, the collections that we have to offer. Without taking too much time, I want to say that this is a continuation of our Persian book lecture series, something that we started with the University of Maryland, with Fatih Mejan, uh, essentially the Roshan Institute for Persian Studies. And it's an ongoing partnership that's been very fruitful. It's been very uh, rewarding. And we've had a number of very interesting lectures that are fully filmed, just like this program is. And the good thing is, once they're filmed, they're put online, it will be there forever for uh, people to use, for students to look at, for teachers to utilize. And I see it as an electronic resource. So um, without taking too much time, I really would like to give uh, Fatih Mejan an opportunity to come up here and say a word or two about Roshan and introduce our lovely speaker, Aida Miftahi, who is giving us a lecture on uh, gender and dance in Iran. Uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Fatima John Befarma, Kadam Thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. I can see that our class is coming in yes. with um, uh, Dr. Akbari, so I'm, I'm delighted that they'll be here uh, in time for the lecture. Yes, indeed, this is a this is a great turnout, and we're really grateful to everyone for making the time in the middle of the day to come. As um, Hirad pointed out, we have had a very fruitful collaboration, which started, I mean, actually, it had started before I was here with my colleague, Dr. Ahmad Karimi Hakkaik, who's here with us today. And um, yes, um, so there were other things happening before I was here, but we did work on it. We, uh, we added, we had a major exhibit, which was visited by about a million people, and then we had a speaker series. And now we're continuing and we hopefully, I mean, it's turning into a tradition that is clearly worth um, continuing. Uh, Roshan Institute, as you all know, is dedicated to the study of Persian culture, language, and literature. And so our collaboration with the Library of Congress is very, very natural, but it has been tremendously rewarding. And I cannot thank enough uh, uh, Hirad and Mary Jane and, and all the colleagues here. Let me just quickly say a couple of words about Dr. Aida Meftahi, our uh, illustrious speaker today. Um, Aida has been with us for the past three years. We hope it will be many, many more years as, as a visiting assistant professor of um, history and Persian studies. 
And she's been basically teaching um, modern Iran and has created a, a really a sensation among the students. I, mean, I realize that the word has negative connotations, but in a very positive sense, people want to learn about present day Iran, and that's because she's been connecting them with the culture, with um, the visual culture, as well as entertainment, as well as basically everyday life. Ida did her PhD at the University of Toronto with Professor Muhammad Tavakoli, himself a very original mind, a very wonderful scholar of modern Iran. I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work. And Ida worked on gender and dance, but it was really a much more complex study of political economy of Iran and the way the economy and politics of performance could give, give us a special window into understanding the version of modernity that Iranians um, crafted for themselves. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Aydam Eftahi for this presentation today. I also want to say that this is a book signing, so we have copies of the book that she's worked so diligently on. Uh, in the back, at the end of the program, uh, feel free to stop by the gentleman in the back over there from our bookstore who is selling copies of her book. Thank you again. Aida Jan, khoshun madi Thank you very much, Hirad and Dr. Keshavars, for your introduction and for facilitating this event. Greetings, everyone, and thank you very much for being here today. It's truly a pleasure to be speaking about my first book at this remarkable place and for such a wonderful audience. As in the case of many for first books or PhD dissertations, Turn, revised into first book, Gender and Dance in Modern Iran has a personal story behind it. Mine starts with, I was 12 when my mother first took me to a dance class. She hoped that dancing would cure my extreme shyness. This is quite a universal story for many performers around the world, but perhaps not a very imaginable one for an accented Iranian woman who has spent most of her life in post-revolutionary Iran, a place not always imagined as a dance-cultivating environment. In fact, it's largely believed that all forms of dance are prohibited in Iran. My first teacher, teachers were an elderly Armenian woman who taught me a variety of dances, including Caucasian, Balletic Persian, as well as Pasadobl, tango, cha-cha, and waltz, a peculiar repertoire for a teenager. When Iraq was bombing in Iran, I was rehearsing dance. These classes inspired me and really didn't cure my shyness. I still struggle with it to this day, but I had to stop them for a while to concentrate, concentrate on preparing for university exams. A few days after the university exams, uh, my caring mother took me to a second dance class. This time with the former soloist of national, of Iran's pre-revolutionary state dance company and one of the strongest and most inspiring and passionate women of my country and a true dance goddess. Taught in private settings, her classes were for women only. Within a few years, my teacher came up with a particular style of choreography for me that suited my relatively depressed character, and I became hooked on into this style. I dedicatedly spent hours every day rehearsing dance while also being a university student in a drastically different world. By late 1990s, the environment was gradually opening up, and we got several opportunities to perform at women-only concerts in front of a few hundred audiences. And as you can see these, in these images, um, we were quite uh, 
well organized and well dressed for the situation. And um, in uh, one of the pictures, you can, you can see her, the way she has been received by all these flowers and all her events, still to this day, she receives so many flowers. In the meantime, after several years of practice, I had developed many questions about the history of dance in Iran, and especially the one we practiced, a pre-revolutionary genre known as Iranian national dance. As neither the genre title nor the little information that I was given was convincing, I began dreaming of pursuing scholarly research on dance if I was ever given a chance. I dreamed of writing a book about Iranian dance. I left Iran for Canada in 2000 with my very supportive husband who's sitting in the audience. And by 2003, I had found my way to the master's program in dance studies at York University in Toronto under the supervision of Canada's leading dance historian, Dr. Selma Odom. I graduated with a historical thesis titled an examination of writings on dance in Iran from 1930 to 1980, in which I examined new, numerous periodicals with the hope of connecting scattered information. Immediately after this degree, I started the PhD program in Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Toronto. And as Dr. Keshavars mentioned, I was lucky enough to have Dr. Tavakoli Tari as my supervisor. As I became increasingly absorbed in my archival and ethnographic research, my dance colleagues in Iran became further involved in a rapidly growing public post-revolutionary um, movement-based genre known as Harakat Mozun. As I discussed in chapters seven and eight of my book, this new genre, which emerged from the theatrical scene only a few years after the revolution, was indeed genealogically related to the national dance genre, but of course with modifications in the title, themes, movements, and appearance of the dancers. Then in 2000s, its founders, all from the revolutionary dissolved state dance companies, pushed for full-length performances. With these negotiations between resilient performers and the difficult and yet mutable regulations of the Islamized theatrical stage, the genre provided the opportunity for underground, underground dancers to perform publicly and get paid for their work. I was amaz amazed by these new developments and to be honest, as a dance practitioner in Canada, sometimes I envied them. It was easier to dance with limitations than to be the subject of stereotypes about Middle Eastern women on a daily basis. Yes, I'm from Iran, and no, I'm not a belly dancer. This was the phrase I repeated numerous times in every introductory situation. After years of practice, I finally admitted my defeat to Canada's multicultural artistic scene and gave up dancing. Instead, I dedicated all my time and energy to pursuing my research, which was by itself quite challenging. In the absence of scholarly sources on this topic, I had to rely mainly on analysis of primary sources, including the discourse on dance in periodicals with various ideological inclinations, including nationalist, Marxist, and Islamic, interviews with artists, performance ethnography, audiovisual sources, including video footages of dance and cinematic productions, and archival documents of official nature. Connecting the sociopolitical discourse on dance, music, theater, cinema, and popular culture with the stage dancing body, as well as the economic and regulatory conditions that govern the stage, I had to come up with a historical narrative about, around the dancing body. 
to trace the ways in which it was shaped and transformed throughout the century. This narrative, I argue, also reflects the corporeal history of urban Iranian women, of course, in the modern era. Conducting archival work in Iran had its own difficulties as the term raqs or dance was not commonly used in the official settings. So I needed to improvise and find ways to convey it when I was in a library or an archive, which sometimes resulted in humorous situations. Despite these challenges, I have to confess that I met many people open to the idea of my research in Iran than, let's say, some of our Middle Eastern studies colleagues outside Iran. By 2010, I knew that one genre and perhaps one cultural category was missing from my research. This was the genre that, as a performer, I was supposed not to get too close to as the cabaret dancer Uh, sorry, um, was, and that was the pre-revolutionary cabaret dancing. This was the genre that as a performer I was supposed not to get close to as the cabaret dancer represented the other, the vulgar, and the sexualized. Steeped in the discipline of the high art genre of national dance and invented 20th century choreography the choreographic genre, which I as explore in, my, in chapter two of my book, traced its trajectory to, the glor to a, gl a glorious past as far as ancient Iran, I had learned to block out the cabaret dancer uninhibitedly. Aesthetically and morally, I assumed that she wasn't worthy of serious scholarly examination. But on the other hand, how could I ignore her then she was the most dominant and visible character of 20th century Iran, dance character of 20th century Iran. She was present in periodicals, novels, and pre-revolutionary commercial cinema, but was always as a morally dubious character. I finally decided to tackle this topic, and I have to be honest, my advisor also pushed me to do that. But was always... Um, um, and I have to confess, again, that uh, I believe uh, this topic became the most important contribution of my research. Just to give you an idea of how the cabaret dancer was depicted in films prior to the revolution, I would like you to watch the trailer of the 1970 film, The City's Dancer, Raqqa Shah. While watching, please pay attention to the way the leading female ro role, Raqqa was characterized. Perhaps many of you are familiar with such stereotypical portrayals of Raqqas, but who was she really? And as a researcher, how could I answer this question three decades after the demise of cabaret dance as a consequence of the revolution when every available evidence was against her? In summer of 2011, after a year of, re a year of search, a miracle interview changed the situation when through a T 
theater actor, I was introduced to a lady who I was told used to be a cabaret dancer. It was rare to find someone to admit this occupation in Iran. During our several hours of interview, which led to another one, she defied all the stereotypes of a cabaret dancer as she proved to be a multifaceted performer. She repeatedly expressed her grief for the gradual demise of the former theater district of Iran, Lalazar, which she described as, quote, the, most, the, the mother of Iranian theater. All great actors of Iran have been trained and have performed in Lalazar. We were taught by our masters to respect the theater stage as stage is a school for the audiences, end quote. Her assertion of the stage as a school of morality was familiar, familiar to me as it was a common notion in the nationalist performing art discourse of early 20th century Iran. But I was unclear as to how an actress who was brought up to perceive the stage as a school of morality became involved in cabaret dancing, an occupation that for decades has symbolized immoralities and social corruption under the Pahlavi state. After st spending several years examining historical accounts on theater and cinema, watching dozens of films, and having more conversations with a few more other performers, I found an answer to this question. Here I would like to briefly show some of these findings. The cabaret dancer, whom I hear sometimes referred to as Raqqas, was associated with and participated in multiple milieus, particularly in Tehran, named the traditional um, minstrel motrevi sphere. Um, and traditional here is um, kind of under question for me. The Lalazar theatrical scene of post-revolution, uh, of post-1950s, pre-revolutionary commercial cinema, as well as the prostitution realm. While, in, while different in nature, it's important to note and in, and in the cons that in the construction and bifurcation of urban culture in 20th century, all of these, uh, spheres fall into the categories um, of low. For instance, when they, they uh, categorize, uh, when cultural, in the cultural categories of high versus low, committed versus degenerate, modern versus unmodern, or traditional, all of these fell into the second category and were considered to be low, unmodern, unmodern and signifies of their vice and degeneration, Eptezal. Raqqas in the Motrevi scene. So it's the first uh, main uh, realm associated with Raqqas. Perhaps the most important arena, which prior to the 20th century involved dance in Iran was the Motrevi or the minstrel scene. The 20th century multifaceted performance troops, which featured the female Raqqas as a member, combined music, dance, acting, and comedy, and, they, and were hired to perform in various public and private functions. After the unveiling on, of 1937, Motrebs also recruited women to perform with them as actors and dancers, replacing the transvestite Zampush of the Qajar era. You can see the, this uh, cross-dress dancer standing in this Qajar era Motrevi troupe. This added to the stigma that they had inher inherited from their predecessors as illiterate, dissolute, alcoholic, and drug addicts. Nevertheless, it was natural for the, those women who were born in Motrevi families and for Motreb's spouses to become performers, as it was a familially constituted um, occupation. Raqqas in the Lalazar um, theatrical scene. Raqqas also joined the Lalazar theatrical scene after 1950, an era recognized to most committed theater historians as the demise of Lalazar. 
In fact, it's her presence that, sig that signifies the demise in most historical narratives. As I've discussed in chapter three of my book, this so-called demise came, came after a golden age of freedom of political expression, largely recognized by theater activities of the leftist theatrical figure, Abdul Hussein and Nushin. Um, if uh, you're familiar, he's uh, mostly known as the father of modern Iranian theater, but also he was a core member of the uh, to the party. This title of golden age of theater in Iran was ascribed to the era between the abdication of Reza Shah and the coup. Even before this golden age, the Lalazar district had a reputation for, for cosmopolitan artistic experimentation with the ideas of modernity and nationhood. For a number of reasons, which I discuss in my book, after 1950, the private sector Lalazar Theater lost both status as a center for high art cultural production and its typical elite or middle class audience. In this time of economic hardship, the manager of Tehran Theater, which was the largest theater at the time, located at Lalazar Street, hired some foreign dancers to perform in segments called attraction or attraction. Following him, other theater owners hired dancers and attraction became prevalent and later took over Lalazar. While economically dancers helped the financial shortcomings, the idea of naked dancers in Lalazar raised new moral issues and reactions from the artistic community. Subsequently, the government based banned performances by foreign dancers in Lalazar in 1957. Instead, the Iranian Raqqas and her Motrib colleagues dominated the attraction scene. As dancing paid better than acting, way better in fact, some Lalazar actresses, including my above mentioned interviewees, joined the attraction scene. The main arena of activity for Raqqas, however, was Tehran's nightlife, which had been expanding since 1940s, when a number of cafes and cabarets opened in various parts of Tehran, including the Lalazar district. As I discuss in chapter four of my book, while the term cafe and cabare, terms cafe and cabare often appear together, these spaces differed greatly in terms of the quality of performance and the price of food and alcohol, as well as the class of their mound. When Tehran's nightlife was expanding in the 1950s, two groups of women were competing for this newly created occupation. Foreign dancers who performed at hotels and theaters, and those Iranian women who dared to set foot on stage to perform in the locus of everyone's attention. Perhaps some of these women, including those from the Motrebi troops or those who were theater practitioners had a performance background, but the majority of the early cabaret dancers had no expertise other than their home-based familial setting solo improvised dance or raqs mehmuni that Iranians do in parties. So these new performers had to train themselves in a variety of trendy genres, including Indian, Arabic, Spanish, and, and, and even American dance by watching films as well as each other. So I'm just gonna show you some video clips of these dances. And I assume that this is American dance. And this looks very Motrebi to me. And as you can 
as you see, she's not naked at all. <laughs> Under the guise of elaborate stage names, such as Azize, Nadia, and Princess, the dancers traveled from one venue to another and presented themselves, their act, and their dance styles according to the venue's regulations and the audience's expectations. As the dancers' age, beauty, on-stage behavior, and outfits fit also contributed to their reception, they were subjugated by their employer employers to some disciplinary corporeal criteria, including obligatory revealing clothing. Some employers also enfor enforced offstage activities on their performances, performers by selling their customers the right to drink with the dancers, a custom that was called fishkhori or jetonkhori. This also could imply that the dancer had agreed to an unofficial contract that required her to meet with the male customer outside the performance venue. While the official law strictly prohibited these venues from facilitating or providing any means for immoral or unchaste sexual activities and from hiring or giving wages to people for this purpose, the government enforced attraction performers to take compulsory medical exams every six months to make sure that the performers were not transmitters of sexual diseases in case they engaged in sexual acts with the audiences. Such irony in government's dual attitude is cl clarified in the city police or Shahrbani's classification of prostitution that recognized all female servants of Tehran's nightlife as prostitutes, thus placing the cafe and cabarets in a liminal position between performance spheres and covert, um, and covert prostitution sites. This all-encompassing and deterministic attitude is also observable in the press discourse of the Pahlavi era, where a cabaret dancer's past, present, or future is strongly associated with prostitution. Appearing in various forms of writings, including reports and fictions, male journalists, journalists sold their papers featuring the desired image of the prostitute Rakos, while simultaneously condemning or ridiculing her. Tehran's nightlife was also publicized as a space for forgetting the day-to-day to the day-to-day -day mechanistic modern life where audience members supposedly delved into their own fantasies by watching performances. But if the nightlife was a space for forgetting and fantasizing, the pre-revolutionary Iranian cinema definitely was a space to watch the fantasy unfold. As I explained in chapter five of my book, Iranian cinema made use of dancing bodies from its early days, even from 1930s, but it was the cabaret raqqas who dominated the screen and who supposedly so seductive dancing body also made, made up for the lack of sex scenes and teased the sexual imagination of the audiences. Beginning with the production of the 1949 film Sharmsar, Café and cabarets became the space which came to represent the, ultiple, the ultimate urban vice on screen as Iranian cinema deployed the pleasure of watching the dissolute while condemning it as immoral. The performers and the audience of cabarets were all part of this attractive spectacle of vice. By 1954, the cabaret team was already exhausted so much that film critics started complaining that most films produced to that date featured cabaret scenes. The improper inser insertions of song and dance segments, they claim, damaged the storyline, 
that had to be paused when the on-screen cafe spectators and the cinema audiences all gazed at dancing bodies. In the cinema discourse, the dancing body was largely associated with eroticism or shahwat and nakedness, berahnegi, which were perceived as selling factors in films. Yet as dance segments guaranteed the box office sale, they were not only inserted into Iranian productions, but also into cowboy films when they were shown in Iran. Even though dance scenes were regularly featured in films in the 1950s and 60s, the Raqqas barely appeared as a character. It's only in the late 1960s, and especially after the aforementioned uh, 1970 film, uh, which we watched the trailer, its trailer, uh, Raqqas e Shah, that the dancer became a lead character. After the success of this tactic, several films with the term Raqqase in the title or Raqqase as a leading character were produced. In the Raqqase-centered mo movies, the, the myths surrounding her quotidian life was persistently present. Some films depicted her as a part-time prostitute, Others portrayed her as a self-sacrificing single mother, but most, more often in the films, she was in love with a man for whom she is ready to change. The resolution of her journey most often involves leaving the public stage of the cabaret by agreeing to marry a male hero and retreating to the private moral realm of the home when she swears to forget her dark past and become his ideal housewife. But no matter what, her past always haunts her. In the Iranian movies, the dancer's life story may have unfolded in different ways, but it always reproduced the myths of her offstage life, something that was locally produced in Iran. Disciplined by the director and framed by his lens, Raqqas's supposedly out of control body, attire, movements, and mimicry and comedy were striking, elating, and recognizable. Her audience not only enjoyed her attractiveness, but also took pleasure in understanding and recognizing her and blaming her at the same time. In the fantasy of films, her male audiences could identify, could identify with the on-screen camera audience and the movie hero, the one who rescued this femme fatale by possessing her. If she didn't obey, she would be slapped and called a prostitute or a harjai. In the final years of the Pahlavi era, however, there was a backlash from the cinema community and the more powerful female casts including Furuzan, who appeared in the film that you watched, who resented the way in which their bodies had been treated on screen. Some actresses left their job forever as they couldn't tolerate the pressures imposed on their bodies in performance. Nevertheless, new faces were replacing them to keep the private sector entertainment industry of the Pahlavi era running an industry which in the absence of government support was highly dependent on the bioeconomy of its dancers and actresses. The revolutionary discourse, which I extensively dis, uh, explore in my book, also responded to the abuse of women's sexuality and their underclad representation and blamed the Pahlavi state for disseminating social corruption. An example of this attitude is evident in an article that recognized sex, dance, alcohol, and drugs as weapons of US imperialism through which the disinherited or Mustazaf countries were held back and weakened. It was in this context that with the revolution of 1979, the public spaces of leisure associated with prostitution and eroticism, such as cinemas, cabarets, as well as the prostitution di district, were burned altogether, 
And this is uh, one of the famous uh, cabarets of um, Talai, uh, which was located on Lalazar Street. While some of the performing arts were, dis were disrupted for a while, they gradually found their way back to stage. Even national dance, as I mentioned earlier, was reshaped to Harakat Mozun. Nevertheless, in government's discourse, and most importantly, in the social imagination of Iranians all around the world, cabaret dance and its interconnected realms, including Lalazar scene, continued to constitute a negative and suspicious space, a contributing factor to the challenges I faced while writing about them. After the submission of my book for publication, I, I initiated a new digital project on Lalazar Street between 1900 and 1979 which I believe will shed light on many aspects of urban, diplomatic, and social history of modern Iran. This, this project is part of the Roshan um, Institute, uh, Roshan Initiative in Persian Digital Humanities. But I know that for at least a decade to come, I will be receiving more smiles and surprises when I introduced its title, Lalazar. But ladies, but ladies and gentlemen, I'm up for the challenge again. Thank you very much for listening. We have uh, about 10 minutes for questions and uh, answers, and I have a request. Since um, there is uh, audiences all the way back there, when they ask something, could you also repeat it uh, so that we have it sure. saved? Thank you very much. Go ahead. A farmer. Questions? Actually, this is not a question. I just want to say that Dr. Mehtabi is has a team of people that we have engaged through Roshan Institute collecting materials and rare documents from photographs to interviews to uh, you know all kinds of documents that will contribute to this amazing project which will really shed light on a very important aspect of the development of the culture so of culture. She, she kind of this could be a separate talk she was <laughs> modest about it no problem <laughs> anyone go ahead the farmer Yes. I'm wondering if the foreign dancers tended to be from certain places or if it was like a certain group of people who occupied that role or a certain style of dancing. Yes. Um, well, there. Okay. So, um, uh, Ali's question here is about. Um, uh, basically the background of the foreign dancers, where they came from, and what type of dances they performed. Um, I think from 1940s on, we see, um, we hear about foreign dancers. I know that, for instance, Polish refugees performed uh, when they were in Iran. Uh, they basically uh, took refuge in Iran uh, in the Polish cafe on Lalazar Street. Other than that, uh, we've heard about, I mean, there are many various versions of this. German dancers, um, French dancers, Ar uh, Arabic dancers, basically uh, belly dancers, and uh, sometimes even people um, claim to be foreign when they were Iranian because it, uh, it was more attractive to people. So. Um, but later on, when this whole scene of uh, cabaret dance uh, grew, uh, they were commissioning performers to come and perform. For instance, Jerry Lewis was one of the people who came and, you know, performed in a, in a cabaret. Um, so it, cabaret became an institution for entertainment, basically, by itself. Thank you. I was wondering if Iranian Armenians played a role. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I would say 
uh, for sure, some of them were some of the Iranian, uh, some of the Armenian uh, performers were also uh, performing in the cabaret setting. But most of the time, we hear their names associated with the more um, sort of the higher art, national art, national dance setting. Um, they were the basically they were the uh, first women to perform on this kind of high art setting. Um, and then gradually they trained more and more Iranian women in ballet, for instance, and uh, opened, opened up for others. Yes. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Could you please name the name of the, uh, your instructor, the very first one where you showed the pictures? And yes. Also, if you consider ballet as a dance, of course. Uh, Yes. Um, so my uh, my dance teacher, first dance teacher, um, uh, the Armenian couple that I mentioned, uh, they were in fact uh, ballet instructors. Um, it was Madame Lazarian, uh, but my serious dance training um, was with doc uh, with uh, Ms. Farzane Kaboli, who, as I mentioned, was the soloist of the National Dance Company prior to the revolution, who had also, as a national dancer, received ballet training before. Um, ballet training, uh, basically ballet kind of started with the immigrants, Armenian immigrants who came to Iran. And yes, I mention it in my second um, chapter and their contributions to this whole uh, idea of national dance and the National Ballet Company of Iran. So yes, they're very present there. Thank you. One more question, Bifana, go ahead. Um, just a quick question about the local or folk classes you consider folk dance. Yes. Where is, where is that in, in the larger picture? Does it ever appear in the early scene? Yes. Yes, um, I think since even an, an earlier time, uh, you see a lot of Russian folk dances, for instance, being performed in 1920s and 30s. Since Reza Shah's time, we've seen um, um, performance of um, folk groups from different regions in, let's say, garrisons and places like that. Um, but since 1940s, there were attempts of staging folk dances, but most of the time they were stylized versions. Uh, um, of course, I'm particularly talking about, you know, official stage in Iran. But here and there you see, you know, them becoming, get, becoming more involved and by, um, 1960s, there's this official group, uh, folk, da folk dance company uh, that uh, was, their, basically their whole occupation was to present folk dances. And sometimes they were groups that they were brought from, you know, different regions. Yes. Thank you for the interesting, memorable, I should say, talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have you mentioned anything about Toat uh, or Rasta Buhoji? Yes. But you didn't show anything here. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, so the question was about uh, Ruhozi or um, theater or Ruhozi dance. Yes, Ruhozi theater and uh, dance were very much associated with Motrebs. So I, yes. So I didn't show them, but uh, they're part of that realm. And yes. You comment a little bit about these Motrebs. You see most of them were Jewish because the Muslims were not allowed to do that. And the young boys were dressed as young girls. Yes. I mean, uh, from what I gathered from this, uh, the, the interviews with, uh, the in, uh, with my interviewees who were also involved with the Motrebi setting, Yes, to a degree they were Jewish, 
um, or non-Muslim, but at some point in Iran, whoever wanted to join the artistic scene had to join the motrefs. If they could afford, they could go to, you know, a better place, maybe a more official institution, which was being developed uh, specially from Reza Shah's era. But before that, really, if you love to do music and you couldn't afford a better way, your local musician was there. And I would say uh, they were the preservers of Iranian culture before, you know. I just have one question. Yes. Growing up, I'm not an expert on dance. I kind of saw uh, dance Iran divided into three subcategories. One was the Tala Rudaki mm -hmm. official stuff and dances like Runa Mar, which were staged and yes. done very professionally. Mm -hmm. Then there was the folk troops, and then there was this whole thing, Farsi, mm -hmm. sort of cabaret, very yes. sort of. Is that a correct way to categorize, or are there more genres or subcategories mm -hmm. that I'm overlooking? Well, um, no, actually, I think, and these are basically the three dance characters that I've been discussing, except for the folk dance that I don't go get into. It's in the context of the, you know, preservation, the national culture of Iran. So in a way that folk dance, the way they pre present it, became part of that national culture more than, you know, uh, presenting a folklore uh, uh, life. So yes, that the way they categorized dance was raqs hay milli va mahalli. So national dances and folk dances. And uh, my teacher was the soloist of Tala Rudaki, and Runama was presented by um, the National uh, Ballet of Iran, which was again housed in Tala Rudaki. So they were kind of very close together. And the third category was the other. Cabaret dancer. <laughs> One more question, and then we have a book signing. Befarma, Befarma. Uh, yes. Father John. Yes. Um, well, I, uh, I intentionally decided to, I mean, in my book, explore just, you know, the official stage. But um, I've, I mean, even, even some of the motrebs or lutis were by themselves kind of gypsy types that they, you know, traveled. And then in the 20th century, they settled. But um, I've heard of gypsy dances in Khuzestan as well. Uh, and I know that they have, I mean, and, and I've heard that they have, you know, some kind of uh, similarities to gypsy dances in Iraq. So there probably, you know, there are some connections. But as I say, I, I said, I don't address it in my book. Is there the so-called uh, Koli? What is the name of them? Koli. Koli, yes. Um, national folk, uh, the Mahalli dancers of Iran, uh, which, uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, my advisor was, my teacher was uh, its soloist, they did stage a koli, a gypsy dance, but I would say it was very stylized. Can I just follow up on that because the koli figure then becomes, in later years, the koli Yes. Woman who can express herself. In fact, the series of Ghazals that Simil Begani has yes. and the Koli in it, this uh, rubric of Koli, and then they ca call things like Koli, Habar, Kon, you know, free dance, and so it becomes an iconic figure. In, in it actually, in the pre revolutionary Iranian cinema, when they wanted to show, you know, dancers um, this style of dance, um, but not get into the whole, you know, problems and complications of um, cabaret dance. They were like um, using uh, gypsy dancers, gypsy dance characters who exactly reflected the same people. One last comment. Thank you very much, Ida John. On your chairs, you have little forms to help us and University of Maryland to better have, have uh, be improve our programs for you. Please feel free to make comments. If you want to be added to our email list for getting uh, event notices, please add, add your emails. Uh, we would love to hear from you. 
and we now have gone high tech. We have a blog, Four Corners blog. We have an example of it on your chair. This will continue to showcase blogs about the African Middle Eastern Division, the Asian Division, European and Hispanic. All the four reading rooms that deal with international collections. And uh, the, the blog on your chair is dealing with one of our Hebrew collections, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, it's a piece on one of the uh, Judaica material that's uh, right now being showcased. So uh, do us a favor and put a little bit of effort into your comments because it really does help us improve. Now let's uh, go to the book signing and please feel free to buy a book from Maida um, and meet with her over there. She will be there to sign if anyone purchases or feel free to come up and uh, speak with, with her directly. We need to put an official end to this because it's now one and uh, researchers need to come and start using the reading room. Thank you very much and thank you very much for making time and coming out of your busy day to this event. Thank you very thank much. You. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.